Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, um, I guess it's traditional at events like this to say how uh, um, pleased and honored you are to be here, but I have to tell you that when Paul Mann invited me to do this talk, the first thing I did, obviously, as we all do, is I went and uh, Googled it, showed a lecture, and then I saw the list of previous speakers, and I thought, wow, no pressure, Tony. So I can honestly say I really am uh, pleased to be here, and I'm uh, honored to be here as well. Um, so today we're going to take a little tectonic tour through the Arctic. I'm just not just going to talk about tectonics. I'm going to talk about a uh, little bit about above ground issues, which are really important in the Arctic, and a little bit about petroleum potential. But the main diet will be the geology, as you'll see. So let's start this off by looking at uh, this is my absolute favourite map of the Arctic. Still, it's been around a long time, and a lot of you will recognise this. It's uh, it, it exists for lots of parts of the world. It's the National Geographic map, which shows the distribution of topography and bathymetry. And it's, it's a really good map for just talking about some generalities about the Arctic. So, um, the first observation we make here is that the Arctic Ocean is a smallish ocean. It's one of the smaller, smallest oceans in the world, and it's wedged between the Pacific, which is over here, and the Atlantic, which is here. And uh, this ocean is sort of crisscrossed by a series of interesting ridges. The uh, Gackle Ridge here, which I had fun talking to John Snow about at the faculty today, that's the current spreading ridge. But then there's this Lomonosov Ridge here, which is a continental splinter, which came off from this margin here. And it's proved to be continental by drilling and by, uh, and by seismic. Um, and then this more diffuse feature, the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge here, which some people think is entirely oceanic, some people think is partially continental. I'm in the Atlantic group, and I'll explain to you why. But then, um, oh, I want to specify, by the way, this map is rather typical of the map I'm going to be showing you today. Um, it's looking down from the North Pole on the Arctic, and most of the maps you're going to see are going to be polar projections like that. But perhaps as just as interesting as the Arctic Ocean itself is the surrounding area. This, there's some absolutely enormous part areas of shelf. The Barents Sea, for example, in the Norwegian and Russian sector, the East Siberian Sea, the Chukchi Sea, some of the biggest areas of continental shelf in the world. And then on the margins of that, we have several petroleum provinces, which actually um, uh, include something in the order of 400 plus discoveries. And you know where these places are. There are great basins like the Tamanpa Kora Basin of Russia, Western Siberia, um, but also, of course, the North Slope of Alaska. So lots of oil and gas around the Arctic, and um, <coughs> something like 200 billion barrels of oil equivalent proven on the margins of the Arctic. And then people debate what the actual yet to find is now. You know, some people uh, uh, say one thing, some people say another, but everybody's agreed that it's probably in the order of hundreds of billions of barrels. So uh, either way you, uh, you look at it, you've got a young continental, uh, sorry, a young ocean, you're surrounded by large continental shelves, and there's discoveries on the periphery, and that makes the oil industry very interested in it, which explains why we've had a significant land grab over the Arctic in the last uh, five years or so. That's shown by these red stars here, so for example, licensing rounds in East Greenland, licensing rounds in the uh, Norwegian Barents Sea, and particularly notable, these stars in the Russian sector, that's the massive allocations of acreage to companies like Russia by the Russian authorities um, over the last five years or so, and, and often partnered with, uh, with Exxon. So, so, first of all, there's been a very big land grab, but in countering that, there's these black stars here. This is where things haven't gone quite so well in the Arctic, and that's not surprising, it's a difficult area, it's cold, dark, it's remote. It's distant from market, so not everything goes right. And this is, um, well, for example, here, this is the postponement of uh, Stathoil's Johan Kasper development, a quite shallow water field in the Western Barents Sea. That's a new oil province in that area. That's been postponed by a few years. This is the giant Stockmanskaya gas field in the Russian sector. That's been postponed indefinitely because of economics. And then we all know that companies have had difficulty getting their drilling programs off the ground in the uh, Alaskan Church, you see, and then the Canadian Beaufort Basin. So the roller coaster goes down, but then recently the roller coaster goes up again. So this green star here is in the Kara Sea, and many of uh, you will have read about the recent discovery made by the Rosneft Exxon partnership in that area. 
And this is a significant discovery. We don't know how significant. There are probably excellent people in the audience today that know more about it than I do. Um, but it's, uh, it's <coughs> certainly a large structure, and there's more to come, and there are a lot more structures like it. So, uh, so this, this helps to illustrate the, the potential of the Arctic and why companies are interested in it. And why is the Arctic so good? Well, this is one of the reasons. So this is basically shows the distribution of known source rocks in the Arctic. <coughs> Hydrocarbon source rocks, and again, it's this polar projection. On the left here, Paleozoic source rocks. On the right, Mesozoic source rocks. And then the dark colors here, the darker colors, show the source rocks themselves. So wherever you see dark shading, that's, that's a, a known source rock. And these include um, several major groups which contribute uh, to the Arctic reserves. Uh, particularly important, the Devonian. Devonian is a major source in the Timan Pakora Basin of Russia go down to the Volga Urals, and of course we all know in Western Canada it's a major source, the Devone and so on. Uh, these two source rocks, they're, they're not particularly related, they're different animals, but nevertheless the Devonian is an is a important source in the Arctic. And then the Triassic. The Triassic of course produces a lot of the hydrocarbons of the north slope of Alaska, and it's also important in the, in the Barents Sea. I'm going to say more about that one later. And then, last but not least, of course, is the Upper Jurassic source rock, which is, produces most of the hydrocarbons of the Western Siberian Basin, one of the biggest hydrocarbon basins in the world, and extends all the way down the Norwegian Shelf as far as the North Sea. So that's all well and good. Lots of nice source rocks, lots of resources. Does that mean materials like this one, where the question mark is, uh, are no good? No, it doesn't. It simply means that there's almost no data there. We just don't know, so we have to infer source rocks there. This is, by the way, the Western si Eastern Siberian Shelf, and um, compared to areas like the Barents Sea and, uh, and Alaska and so on, you're talking about just a few seismic lines and no wells whatsoever. So everything there is influenced, and that's the point I want to make about the Arctic. Vast differences in data density and data coverages. So having set the scene, this is how I'm going to structure the rest of the talk. So I want to talk firstly about some key above ground issues in the Arctic. And then I want to go on and talk about the geology and, and take a tectonic tour and, uh, and have a look at the hydrocarbon potential. Normally I would do this the other way around. I would talk about the geology then come in at the end with some dire warnings about how difficult it is to work in the Arctic. But I know that the main menu today is supposed to be geology, so I'm going to get those out of the way first. It's not just about getting them out of the way because the above ground issues are really important in the Arctic. In fact, I would go as far as to say that geology isn't the main issue in the Arctic. Um, geology gives you the basis to find the resources, and indeed we really sincerely believe that the resource base is there. That's just the base of this pyramid. Before you get to the top of this pyramid, which is the willpower, the motivation to actually drill, to explore, and to develop, You've got to get through all of these other layers of the pyramid, um, which are crucially important in the Arctic. So the environment, the technology to work, markets and infrastructure in a distant, cold, dark, remote place. Licensing terms, which are all far too short in the Arctic to get any work done in a realistic time. The people that live there, the stakeholders, um, and other stakeholders, and last but not least, corporate resources. Not every company's got enough money to do this area. So all those things are critical before you get to the top of the tree. And first and foremost, of, uh, of course, in the Arctic, when you think of the Arctic, you think of ice. And seasonal ice is, the, is probably the main issue in the Arctic. And most of you know what the situation is, that, uh, that, that, that you have seasonal ice, which is, covers almost the entire Arctic in the middle of winter, in February, except for this little area here, next to Norway, warmed by the Gulf Stream. And then if you go to the other end of the, of the uh, spectrum, the end of summer, beginning early of October, the ice is at its, at its minimum, and you've got clear water around significant parts of the Arctic. And this is the time in which you could work in the Arctic. And actually this ice was at its minimum in 2012. Some, all, some of you will know that that was the richest <coughs> ice we've ever had in the Arctic in living memory, and you could actually sail from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean at that time. After that, it got a bit uh, icier again. So essentially, that constrains how you could work in the Arctic, the time that you've got to work in the Arctic. And then, on top of that, what if you had an oil spill in the ice? If you have an oil spill in the middle of ice, that's not very easy to 
deal with, and then say you had a Macondo style event, and the, ice, and the optic ice was just rushing in, how would you deal with that? And that's got people's attention. That's why a lot of money is being spent right now on uh, the effect of oil in ice. A lot of research money is going on that. And then we mustn't forget, as I mentioned earlier, that there are people that live in the Arctic. These are some pictures of the Alaskan settlements, small second settlements on the North Slope. These stakeholders here, they live there. Their way of life existed before the oil industry. They would like to get the prosperity, but they would like also to maintain their way of life when the oil industry is gone. And so these people have to be looked after, as do many other stakeholders. And then, before I do get onto the geology, onto this top of the pinnacle here, cost. And cost is a major, major issue in the Arctic. This is a little graph here that basically shows cost on the, on the, on the vertical axis, and on the horizontal axis we've got time. And uh, the green here is the crude price, so we all know what's been happening with the oil price, right? We've enjoyed a nice period of high oil price, it leveled off for a while, and now it's starting to drop, quite alarmingly. But meanwhile, exploration and development costs have been rising and rising, so that margins right now are really pinched. And that's why I've put this picture here of George Kirkland, the boss of EMP in, uh, in Chevron, a year or so back, telling everybody who would listen that uh, it's very hard to make a book out of complex offshore projects. Now, I wasn't even talking about the Arctic. When you get to the Arctic, it gets even more difficult. And right now, that red line is probably crossing the green line for, for many areas in the Arctic. So it's a rocky ride, it's a difficult ride. But at the same time, back to those resources, people want to do it. They want to do the Arctic because they're lower the resources. And my, my own company is no exception. So this is my company's portfolio in the Arctic. And um, not as big as the Rosneft Exxon one, but nevertheless a sizable portfolio. So we're in Greenland. We've got lots and lots of acreage in the Barrett Sea. That's obviously Statoil's home territory, it's our stomping ground. Um, and we're in, the, in Alaska, and then in subarctic areas like the Sea of Okhotsk and, uh, of course, northeastern Canada, where we're doing a lot of exploration and appraisal right now. And if you look at this whole thing here, you see this is a, this is a very large investment, even at the exploration stage. So to protect an investment like that, what do we do? Do we work these areas like postage stamps? Look at this area here, look at this area here, look at it all individually. No, this is probably best looked at as a whole, because one thing's for certain is that these areas around the Arctic Ocean relate to each other in some way. So that puts a constraint on you to do regional work, and I was given the privilege of doing a regional uh, project for the company with a small and very talented bunch of enthusiasts, and the idea was to pull together the whole Arctic story, not in detail, but to, uh, to look at how one area relates to another. And that's really what the rest of this is going to be about. So when we do a regional study, those of you who know them, you know how it works. We work from the general to the particular. So at the top of this, top of the tree, plate tectonics. Plate tectonics dictates everything. How the plates move is where we have to start, because then we can start to understand the structural evolution and the structural features. And we can also understand the paleogeographic relations. You can't do that without the plate movement. And then when you've done all this homework, then you can start talking about source and reservoir distribution, where it is now and where it was in the past and how those two things relate, because it's how those two things relate that help you to predict where source rocks might be, quite outside of the ones that are already known. So let's start with the plate tectonics. And this is the main diet of today. I want to show you how I think and how the team thinks the Arctic evolved. Um, so, and we're going to start 130 million years ago. Now, of course, there was a plate tectonic history before, but it didn't start here. But this is basically when the Arctic Ocean, as we know it today, the present day Arctic Ocean, starts to open. This is the end of the Jurassic, beginning of the Cretaceous, and this time's here in the early Cretaceous. And at that time, we can see all the continents of the world are basically sitting there in one place. This is the supercontinent of Pangaea. And they're glued together by a series of orogenic belts. This, is, this blue one here is the Caledonian belt, representing the collision between Laurentia and Baltica. And the red one here is the Urals, the Uralian belt, representing the collision of Baltica and Siberia. And the blue one here 
400 million years ago, it culminated. This one culminated in the, essentially, in the Triassic 250 million years ago. And then, maybe by coincidence, maybe not, where those two orogenic belts hit the Pacific, the Paleo Pacific margin here, we've got this interesting indentation or reentrant. And this feature is usually called the Southern UEC. And what we're going to see is, as we go through this animation for the next few million years, we're going to see this chunk of continent here, which is uh, parts of present-day Alaska, but also parts of present-day <coughs> Siberia, which we call Chukotka, rotating around counterclockwise to fill this hole as subduction starts to consolidate along the entire Pacific margin. <coughs> so let's have a look how that happens. So now we see this counterclockwise rotation. This is the way most people think it happened. And eventually, Chukotka collides with Siberia. And the open, this basin here, this triangular basin opening around a pole somewhere here in the Mackenzie Delta, that's the Canada Basin. And inevitably, if you have that kind of opening in a small confined space, and this is something you've got to come back to, you must have a shear margin at the distal end. And this is a theme I'm going to come, to, come back to throughout this talk, the existence of shear margins, the necessity for shear margins in the Arctic, and what that does to us in terms of exploration. So now, from here on in, we're going to see, instead of the Pacific influences on the Arctic, we're going to see Atlantic influences trying to push up here um, between Greenland and North America, the opening of the Labrador Sea and Baffin Bay. And we think that that influence feeds up into the Arctic to form a new basin, which I'll show you. <laughs> so now we see this Atlantic influence, and the new basin that's formed up here is the Makarov Basin. Not everybody thinks it forms this way, that's our interpretation. I'll explain why later. Um, and you can see, possibly here, the connection between uh, Baffin Bay and Makarov in terms of spreading vector. And we also ought to remark that as this happens, we probably have the necessity for more shear here along the Siberian margin. The yellow again showing the shear margin. So now, the next thing we're going to see happening, and this, is, this that by the way was in the uh, late Cretaceous, now we're into the Cenozoic. Next thing we're going to see happening is the Northeast Atlantic opening, relaying through, the, through this shear zone here into the Eurasia Basin, which is the currently opening basin in the Arctic, currently uh, the current area of sea floor spreading. Mm -hmm. and so we, now we see that taking place. And uh, I think you can see from that, that's the Eurasia Basin, where spreading is currently taking place. This is the Northeast Atlantic. And this area here is the Fram Strait, an area that some people at the University of Houston are actually working on right now. And it's a critical area because it's the area that connects the Arctic and the Atlantic. And around right about this time, just after this time, we start to see the first real circulation between these oceans. And incidentally, that's the time that the Arctic climate really comes in when it actually starts getting cold. Before that, it was actually quite warm. <laughs> then a bit later than that, we get the sea ice. So from here on in, I think we just, uh, oh, I just wanted to mention again, there's a, a theme I keep harping on, that, we, that inevitably as this happens, we develop shear margins, a very well-known one here, we think also here. And then, then we proceed through to the present day. Now, okay, that was a, a three-stage model for the opening of the Arctic Ocean. And how do we know it actually happened like this? Uh, and the real answer is we don't. We're pretty certain of what happened in the tertiary. We probably, that last phase of opening is pretty well documented. The rest of it's a bit blurry because this parts of the Arctic Ocean here don't have much in the way of magnetic anomaly. So you have to, you have to infer from things like uh, rift timings and magnetic, mag magmatic dates. And that's what we've done, timing the rifting around the periphery of the Arctic Ocean. That's the sort of thing we've used to constrain it. This scale here, this is a, this is a time scale here in the vertical. And, and what this basically shows is for the different provinces around the Arctic, we've tried to take the best and best documented ma magmatic dates we can. And when we do that, they seem to fall into three groups, which represent these three phases. The opening of the Canada Basin in the early Cretaceous, the opening of the Makarov Podvodnikov Basin in the late Cretaceous, and then the opening of the Eurasia Basin um, in, this, in the Cenozoic. So let's just um, 
that, that animation went very quickly, so let me try and summarise with a series of sketches, again, what I thought the main, uh, the, the main events were. So now, um, I want to confuse you all by flip-flopping the Arctic, and uh, on these pictures here, uh, Russia is now at the bottom, and Greenland, and North America, and Norway are all pointing up. And it gives you a different perspective. We're looking at it from a Pacific perspective here. And this is the Pacific margin. This is the south of the U.S. Sea. And those of you who have worked Alaska, you'd be interested in the Brooks Range and so on. And what, at this sort of time, the American Cordillera and the Brooks Range and this little outpost, probable outpost of, of the Brooks Range and Wrangell Island, they're all kind of lined up straight. But as you probably know, that's not the way they end up. They end up curved around, something like this. And this is, of course, partly because implicated in this rotational movement we see. And we're going to see this piece rotating here. And this is the Canada Basin opening. And by the way, this little microcontinental chunk, the uh, Chukchi borderlands, is rotating counter to the, to the Canada Basin opening as that, as that happens. And we can see the south of UEC here closing and the subduction zone consolidating along the Pacific margin. The next stage is that this is now completely closed, it's sutured, this has formed a fold belt, this is called the Chukotka fold belt, and now Makarov Basin opening linking up here with the Labrador Sea opening, uh, orthogonal to the previous movement, so you've got a complete 90 degree change in plate vector. And at this time I also ought to mention the shearing along the Siberian margin which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. Next stage is the beginning of the Cenozoic, and, uh, and this is the, uh, the stage where the Makarov Basin has completed opening, and you can see here the connection, probable connection with Labrador Sea and Baffin Bay, continued shearing along the Siberian margin. Now this stage, 55 million years, this is where the Atlantic is starting to open, and interestingly, Atlantic spreading is taking place and Labrador Sea spreading is taking place, and Greenland seems to act like a little keystone, it's being pushed northwards, it's colliding with the Canadian margin, and it's actually creating a major fault belt. This is the Eureka and the West Spitsbergen orogenic belt. So now, let's move on to 33 million years. Now we're at the end of the Eocene, and this is a time of major plate reorganization. Um, at this time, the Labrador Sea stops spreading. That Greenland stops moving north, and this fold and thrust belt, the Eureka fold belt is deactivated, it's, it becomes nascent, and then the, um, and, and this is the spreading here and taking place in the Eurasia Basin, and this is probably the end of shearing along the Siberian margin, and this margin here, linking up northeast Atlantic to the Arctic Ocean, um, actually starts to more passively drift instead of shearing, although there's, there's probably some shearing still taking place along that. And then lastly, a reminder of this link between the Arctic Ocean and the, um, and, and, and the Northeast Atlantic Ocean um, uh, along the Fram Strait with that link up happening uh, about 18 million years ago. So, at the risk of hammering the point home too much, we have a three-stage Arctic plate model. Firstly, this rotational opening of the Canada Basin in the early Cretaceous. Secondly, the opening of the Makarov Podbodnikov Basin in the late Cretaceous, completely orthogonal to that, and then the opening of the Eurasia Basin in the Northeast Atlantic um, from the beginning of the tertiary up to the present. And the reason I keep coming back to this three stage model is I want you to appreciate the significant changes in plate vector that have probably happened as the Arctic Ocean developed. And I also want you to appreciate that this is a small, confined ocean, still only <coughs> tenuously linked with the, with the Northeast Atlantic. So, and when you get rotational opening in a confined space like this, you will get shear on the margins. Sometimes we know about the shear, some places we theorize it. It is important to note that because it's important for how we explore those margins. So, I want to spend a little bit of time now looking at some of those shear margins. And this is a very useful map to do that from. This is a crustal thickness map. On this map, the crustal thickness has basically been inverted from gravity, 
is from some work by Alvi et al. And it's a very convenient map because it allows you to show the continent, to see the continent ocean boundaries very well. Um, cold colors, bluish colors on here are basically a thick crust, and the warm colors here are thin crust, with the reds being the thinnest crust of all in the ocean basins. So we can look at the Arctic Ocean as a ta uh, tail of three mega shears. I'll show you where they are now. The first is this one, the gear line or the gear zone. This is a line that goes between Norway and the Mackenzie Delta in Canada, and it's probably one of the most impressive linear features on the surface of the globe. You can't help but notice it. Um, and uh, this has got a very long history, which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a while. Then the Canada Basin shear margin. We talked about the rotation of this part, uh, part of the ocean here. And a lot of people put it here along the Lamarsov Ridge, that continental fragment that I mentioned earlier. On the other hand, um, some people put it there, along the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge. And I'm in that second camp there, uh, but I'll explain to you later why that is. And then finally, that shear along the Siberian margin that I mentioned earlier. Um, we call this one shear the Katanga Bering Shear. That's, that's our name, just because it extends between Katanga Bay here in Russia and the Bering Strait. I mean, in fact, it's probably a whole series of different features. Uh, but just for a convenient shorthand, we're calling it one for the time being. So let's have a look firstly at this Canada Basin Shear. Um, where did it go and, and how did it work? Well, the pole of rotation is here in the Mackenzie Delta, and it's rotating counterclockwise. The extinct ridge can be seen on gravity inversion, going about as far as there, but you can't really push it any further. Um, it's, it, it's the, the imprint is lost. And then, though most of the literature has the shear margin there, I think you'll appreciate it doesn't really fit with high angle rotation in a confined space. It's rather straight, and it makes all kinds of plate tectonic problems. That's one reason why we think it might be down here and trained somewhere in the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge. There's another reason too, and that's if you look at the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge, it's rather peculiar. That's, by the way, it's this feature here. This is the Lomonosov Ridge, this is the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge. And this is just a simple uh, bathymetric map, a relief map, if you like. Um, and it shows that we've got this strange imbricated rifted morphology, uh, even at present day, on the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge itself which is quite unusual, particularly as it's parallel to this margin here, suggesting that something may have separated from this margin. Then if we go to the ridge itself and look at a few existing seismic lines there are there, uh, this is from some work by, uh, by Bruval, we can see in fact that the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge is actually quite strongly faulted. It's, uh, that's a very unusual behavior for a piece of ocean floor, and there's rotational faulting and synrif development and so on in here. So one postulate might be that this represents the rift phase that eventually separated this thing off from here, which of course means that the shear margin must be in here because the shear margin was prior to this separation. So <coughs> my thesis is that there may be continental material entrained within that ridge and that the shear margin might have been there. But it's still up for grabs, it's still up to be, for debate. Now let's have a look at that shear along the, the Siberian margin. This one's really interesting. If you look at the Eurasia Basin, the current spreading basin, the basin seems to come to a screaming halt here at the Laptev Sea. There is a rift down here, but there's not enough rifting there to uh, anything like account for the amount of extension that must have happened along here. Let me flip that on its axis again and look at it from the Greenland side. So this is the Eurasia Basin, and there's about 500 kilometers of ocean here, which goes to almost nothing in the Laptev Sea. And there's not enough tertiary rifting to account for that. So what that should mean is that there's got to be shear along the margin here. It must be accommodated by shear. And this is not an unusual thing to see worldwide. Here's, the, here's a, an obvious example. This is, the, this is the Red Sea. So the Red Sea is spreading today. It's trying to push up into the Mediterranean Sea, but it doesn't want to go into the rigid ocean floor of the Mediterranean Sea. Instead, it stops, and there's a little bit of rifting in the Gulf of Suez, but not enough, and the movement is relayed sinistrally 
through the Dead Sea Transform. And that's probably, we think, similar to what's happening here at the terminus of the Eurasia Basin. And what that means, of course, is that uh, as we go along this margin, we might expect to see evidence that it's a shear margin. But back to what I told you earlier about eastern Siberia. This is an area with almost no seismic, just a few seismic lines crossing the line here, no wells. So where we do have seismic lines, uh, there is, there's evidence that we may have a shear margin there. This is a tectonic features map of the eastern Siberian <coughs> shelf. Here's the seismic line. And this is a published seismic line from the work of a Russian worker called Sekotov, uh, which shows the sort of stratigraphic detachment uh, and, and the, uh, the abrupt terminations that may be typical of a shear margin in this area. Just going along the trend, searching for more evidence. This is Wrangell Island that I mentioned earlier. Seawards of that, we actually have a deep basin called the North Chukchi Basin. Um, and if you look at the few seismic lines we, that have been published off Wrangell Island, we see a lot of folding and thrusting, which may relate to the folding and thrusting of Brooks Range type age that we see on Wrangell. On the other hand, seeing this kind of thing adjacent to a deep sedimentary basin, you could be convinced that there is a shear going down there. It's not, it's, it's not uh, too far-fetched. Then if we go further still, this is Wrangell Island here. This is the Brooks Range. People have been remarking for years and years about this apparent dextral offset between Wrangell and the, the Brooks Range. And this offsets four or 500 kilometers, about the same scale that I was talking about in terms of the missing extension on the Eurasia Basin earlier on. So it, say, it, again, it wouldn't strain credibility to think that we've got a dextral shear exiting somewhere via the Bering Strait that's causing this kind of effect. Uh, this is, this is a, essentially a testable hypothesis as more information is gained on, the, on this um, uh, East Siberian shelf as more seismic is shot, we can see whether this is true or not. But at least this hypothesis is testable. Okay, so uh, lastly, I want to come to the Gear line. And this is a, um, as I mentioned earlier, extremely impressive lineament. And indeed, this lineament, without too much imagination, you can see it might have facilitated the separation and the rotation of the Canada Basin. It might, it might actually mark the line of separation, for those who is in fact a very old line. Um, but it's, it's certainly best known in this portion here, the Barents Sea shear margin. So to position you, this is Norway, this is the Norwegian Barents Sea, this is the island of Spitsbergen, and this is the shear margin, and this is one of the best studied shear margins in the world. So now I'm going to flip us around again in a very disorientating way so that we can now see this piece from the Norwegian perspective. So here, we're now here, Norway's here, Spitsbergen here, Greenland here. And th on this map on the right here, we can see something about the Paleozoic history of the De Geer zone. And generally speaking, uh, oh, by the way, I ought to say here, the pinkish color here represents orogenic belt, and Craton is shown here in, in brown. This is a very a diagrammatic view, obviously. But generally speaking, we can say the Caledonian mountain chain, which culminated its activity 400 million years ago, does an abrupt left turn at this margin here, with a lot of sinistral shear going through there and eventually finding its way into the Inuitian fold belt, which is an equivalent age fold belt in Greenland and Arctic Canada. So this, is, this has a very old history. Then if we jump forward to the, to the, to the Paleogene, when this this line was relaying spreading between the Northeast Atlantic and the Arctic Ocean. We can see some of the phenomena associated with the shear zone. Um, again, to give you some colors here. Ocean floor in the lilac color. The bluish color here represents sedimentary basins. And this pinkish color here, it didn't come out too well, is um, our orogenic belts or inversions, compressive features essentially. And then these two seismic lines here in blue across the margin show features typical of shear margins, up-tilted basements, stratigraphic detachments, and so on, and eventually <coughs> weighed down by this huge amount of uh, late Cenozoic sediment going over the top of them. Um, and if we look at this margin, we can see a whole range of phenomena which start to get important when you're looking for oil and gas. This is an area in which oil and gas is being explored for. 
And these phenomena include this. And this is where the payoff comes, because this is, this is uh, the kind of thing we look for in shear margins and effectively uh, uh, influence the way we explore them. So we see inversions all over the place. Um, and we see transpressive belts. That's the West Spitsbergen uh, fold belt, fold thrust belt. And then we see the development of pull-apart basins. Interestingly, we see little slivers of that margin later detaching and moving away as it passively spreads to form microcontinents. There seems to be a generic association between microcontinents and shear margins, which some of us are currently investigating. And then perhaps most interestingly of all, if you're a basin modeler, there's this kind of thing. The spreading ridge actually, in this case, transits along the margin, and that's very different to a divergent <coughs> margin where the spreading ridge moves further away with time once the ocean the plates separate. So the, the, you, the margin essentially, sorry, the uh, spreading ridge effectively moves along this margin. And we can see that in this next sequential diagram. This is the, uh, this is basically that same shear margin starting in the early Eocene here, the top left, and present day bottom right. And you can see here the development of some of the features I was mentioning, the development of a series of pull-apart basins, development of transpressive, and trans, uh, transpressive features and inversions, and then these little brown things here are these microcontinents separating away from this margin as it goes into passive spreading and ending up quite a long way away from the, from the original margin. So that basically shows some of these features. And why is this important? Why are these features important? Well, this is just one of a series of shear margins which we see from the Atlantic to the Arctic. <coughs> this basically shows that concept. And we are um, we're here now looking at the southern Atlantic and going all the way up through the Atlantic to the, uh, to the Arctic Ocean. And the ocean, oceans are covered, colored here, sorry, according to the age at which they uh, first broke up. So, for example, Jurassic here in blue, early Cretaceous in dark green, late Cretaceous in light green, tertiary in brown. And basically this shows, give or take a few jumps, a, a gradual propagation northwards of the Atlantic Ocean. And the Arctic Ocean is this little piece up here. So you can view the Arctic as, firstly, an earlier part that was linked to Pacific uh, subduction, then a later part that was linked to the northwards propagating Atlantic. But coming back to those shear margins again, and, and these are <coughs> some of the shears going all the way down to the Falklands transfer here. This De Geer line that I mentioned earlier sits right here. And here's another very well-known one, the equatorial shear zone. Now, I'm sure some of you in this room have worked on the western African part of the shear zone because it's an important petroleum province. That's an important petroleum province. This is an important petroleum province. Both of them show a range of phenomena which are very typical of shear margins and could bear more research into actually comparing how these things work. And I'll sum up at the end some of the characteristics of shear margins, which will explain why that could be important. But of course, with all the plates moving around and rotating and changing directions and so on, that means we can start to build a paleogeography, a paleogeography that's not necessarily intuitive. It's not necessarily the way you would expect it to be. I, I just want to show you one example of a suite of maps we've made. And this is a late Jurassic paleogeography of the Arctic. And again, we're now looking at this more or less from the Russian side, Russia down, Greenland up. And the configuration, on, uh, first of all, I'll go through the colors. The blue color here is, uh, is deeper marine type deposits. The, brown color represents land, the greenish colors represent low land or alluvial plain and so on. And this is this embayment in the Pacific, the south of New East Sea sitting there, and these dark areas here are a bunch of island arcs which are accreting to the Siberian margin and also accreting uh, to Alaska at the time. So, okay, that's the configuration. So, thinking about the basins and the areas which surround the Arctic Ocean, where were they at this time? And this comes as a bit of a surprise because we find that the north slope of Alaska and the Mackenzie Delta of Canada are actually sitting there facing out onto the Paleo-Pacific. As is the Laptev Sea, which actually is now on the far side of the Arctic Ocean from the Pacific. This is um, 
that's actually also on the Pacific margin. But then in, you have the interior basins, Western Siberia and the Atlantic Rift, which is going to eventually become the Atlantic Ocean. It's important to understand these things because you well know this is a major time of source rock development. But this is, a, this is, this is also about the fact that relationships between stratigraphic units, reservoirs, source rock, fasces, and so on, are not intuitive in the Arctic. Let me give you one example of why that is. This is just an, um, an example showing source rock distribution in the late Triassic. And I mentioned earlier, this is a big time for the Arctic because this is when the source rocks of Alaska were laid down and also all the important source rocks elsewhere. So let me just uh, tell you what these maps show. Left side, paleogeographic setting. Right side, present day setting. And the greenish colors on this represent the source rock distribution where it's known, and then the striped green represent areas where you might infer a source rock based on the paleogeography. So when you look at this, you think, well, this must be the case, that these three areas here on different sides of the, of the Arctic Ocean, they must be related. Close those oceans up and they're the same source rock, the ones in the North Slope, the ones in the Sverdrup Basin of Canada, and the ones in the Norwegian and Russian Barents Sea. But in fact, that's not the way it turns out. The way it turns out is that the Barents Sea and Sverdrup source rocks are part of an intracratonic basin, um, and there is a pro-delta type source representing deltas going into that basin. On the other hand, quite differently, the north slope of Alaska is a, a passive margin upwelling session on the fringes of the Paleo-Pacific Ocean. So same age source rocks, quite different animals and quite counterintuitive when we look at this picture here. And the same can be applied to the, uh, the, to the reservoir. So this again is the late Triassic, doing the same with reservoir here, paleo setting here on the left, present day setting on the right. Um, brown colors representing where we know there are reservoirs and striped <coughs> colors where we think there might be reservoirs based on inference and based on the paleogeography. So we look at the present day, this is the Yenisikatanga Trough. It's a, a major rift basin in Siberia, which empties out presently into the Russian Arctic Ocean in, in the Laptev Sea. And if we go to the Paleo position again, it's here. It's actually on the Pacific margin. It's emptying out into the Pacific with all of the inferences you might make, therefore, on the distribution of fasces as you go from here to here through that rift. So so that's simply to make a point that the relationships are counterintuitive uh, when we're trying to predict a reservoir and source, and you've got to understand the paleogeography, and to do that, you've got to understand the plate tectonic movements. So that basically brings me to a sum up. <coughs> so the Arctic Ocean was a small, confined ocean bounded by young basins and shear margins. I hope I've made that case. We prefer a three stage opening model, and there are radical changes in plate vector. People will tell you they disagree with the three-stage model. There's all kinds of different models. Um, but almost nobody will disagree that there were radical changes in plate vector. And that's what's really important, the change in plate direction. We propose a major shear along the Siberian Chukchi margin. And that's sort of new. It's been suggested in the literature before. We think that it's an inevitable constraint of plate tectonics. And it's a testable hypothesis. You can't understand the paleogeography without the plate kinematics. That's what I was showing in those last few slides. There are definitely multiple source rocks and, and reservoirs, but the relationships are sometimes counterintuitive. And the Arctic's favorable for oil and gas and probably <coughs> contains a large proportion of the world's undiscovered resources. Some people say up to 25%. I think maybe a bit less than that, but it's still pretty good. Um, but geology isn't the main issue in the Arctic exploration cost to the environment, it's local stakeholders. So before I finish, let me just go back to those shear margins that I was remarking on all the way through. If you know there are shear margins, rather divergent continental margins, you can start to make some predictions about elements of the petroleum system. And that's what this summarizes. So structure-wise, um, there are very distinct margin geometry, or rather abrupt margin geometry for shear margins. Traps themselves are very different in those on divergent 
uh, continental margins. And then, of course, this, the structural development affects the uplift and preservation. We saw transpression, we saw inversion along the margins. That affects uplift and preservation of hydrocarbons, preservation of parts of the petroleum system. Um, thermal history, that's conditioned by the transit of a ridge along the margin rather than away from the margin. And that makes very specific predictions about the temperature history that you might see. And of course, that also uh, affects maturation. Um, and um, it affects uplift and preservation as well. Lastly, paleogeography, the present spatial relationships, reservoir distribution and source rock distribution are basically all conditioned on the kinematics. Um, you have to understand those before you can really understand why the present spatial relationships and what they are and to infer where the reservoir and source rock might be. All very general, uh, you might say, but I suppose I told you some of the specific um, exploration ideas that came out of this work, my company wouldn't be too pleased with it. So uh, instead, I'll just say uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, yes, uh, great geology. Uh, what uh, constraints or not do, does the uh, law of the sea put on the companies, uh, the countries that have adhered to it or adopted it or not? Yeah, there's a lot of law of the sea discussion in the, in, in the Arctic right now, as you know. The different, com um, the different uh, countries, Canada uh, and uh, Russia, US and so on, are holding a lot of... Uh, debates almost as we talk. Um, the constraint really is on the distribution of continent and ocean, isn't it? Because, uh, because if you have a continental shelf and a contiguous continental shelf, you can start making arguments about what land is yours and what land isn't yours. Um, so I've been very surprised to see um, uh, some quite radical interpretations from some of the law of the sea people about where the continent actually is. I've even seen one interpretation that has most of the Arctic Ocean as not ocean floor at all, but founded continent. Those interpretations really do exist. And you have to wonder how many of them are political and how many of them are real. So, um, so I, think, I think our job in the next few years is to try to sort of uh, keep it scientific um, in the, uh, the light of the political constraints that we know about. Does that answer your question? Yeah. What uh, development is actually going to go ahead of all these discoveries that we've talked about? So what development is going to go ahead? Well, the one that we know is going to go ahead is the, um, is the development of the oil that's recently been found in the Western Barrett Sea, and I'm pleased to say we operate that. That's what we would call in Statoil the workable Arctic. That's areas that you can develop with present technology. There aren't that many of those. The areas where we have a lot of seasonal ice, that's, an, that's something that we call the stretch Arctic, where you need to, you actually, you can use present technology, but it, but, but it needs to be um, enhanced, and it will take some time. And then there are areas of the Arctic that are almost impossible to exploit now, we, and, and that's basically the extreme Arctic, where we actually need to develop new technology. But to back to your question, not that many offshore developments, new offshore developments in the Arctic right now. We, we do expect them in the Norwegian Barrett Sea. We'll watch Exxon and Rosneft and see what happens in the Kara Sea. That will be a good testing ground. And poor old offshore Alaska and, uh, and the Mackenzie Delta are still basically hidebound by permitting issues, stakeholder issues, cost issues, and so on. And so very few developments are going on there. Stockman of Skoya, that Russian, uh, that Russian field I mentioned earlier, that might be 10 years away before it starts. How does the oil get out of the workable Arctic? How does the oil get out of the work? Well, um, you know, in the area I was talking about, the uh, subsea solution is actually possible. Um, and, and, in, and, and that's also in the area that never has ice. So that there's, and there are very few areas in the Arctic like that. It's only really the Barents Sea where the Gulf Stream is licking up against the Arctic where you have free water all year round. So in a way that's a bit exceptional. Still as far as I know, it's not a development solution where we have seasonal ice. 
You think about all the implications of that. You have a subsea installation that gets covered up once a year. Um, that's where a lot of the research money is going. And that's why this, this is really for people that are in this for the long game. I, th I think eventually people are going to have to decide on the Arctic. They're going to have to decide, do we want to do this? Do we want to pay the price? Or do we want to find cheaper energy somewhere else? There's, there's a, um, always a view that resources will inevitably be developed. And that's not really true. They'll only be developed if the break-even price is good enough. And if you can get ch energy cheaper, you might do that. <clears throat> Any more questions? Tony, I find it intriguing you showed the shear zone. Are those shear zones still active, sharing, or is it just passed? Um, the, the, all of them, um, except the De Gea line, are, 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 we think, inactive. So the one I mentioned in Siberia, and the, we now see rifting in the Laptev rift. So it looks like the rifting is trying to propagate through. However, there's still some shear because you, you get the occasional earthquake focal plane mechanism which shows sinistral shear going into Russia. So a little bit there, but I was talking to John Snow today about the uh, Fram Strait between the Atlantic and the, and the Arctic. And there, um, we have a, we, first of all, we have a very um, slow spreading piece of ocean that still seems to be twisting dextrally and, and, and undergoing a little bit of transtension. And uh, that's also verified by work onshore Svalbard. So that shear zone is still moving, although it's nowhere near as active as it was in the past when it was causing lacking great inversions and so on. Any more? Yep. I couldn't tell from your, your model um, where the Chukchi borderland was coming from. It just suddenly appeared in the middle of the Arctic Ocean around 125. Do you think that it is part of Arctic Canada in the Paleozoic or part of Siberia? It, um, well, it's, it's, it's sort of both, because if you fold it back, it, it, it sort of forms the bridge between Arctic Canada and, and, and Siberia. This, the answer is really um, Arctic Canada. Um, it's, uh, sorry, go on. As part of the spear drop or part of the Caledonian orogeny, I would say? No, really, really uh, we think probably it fits quite snugly into the, uh, into the, into the spear drop. Uh, Adjacent to and a little bit west of this, this railroad, and and, and you, you've you've probably seen some of Aston Embry's work where he basically talks about Crocker Land, which is the land that was north of the railroad and actually sort of feeds sediment into the railroad basin. So probably this Chukchi borderland could have been part of that. Um, but there's also parts of Chukotka, the, the beast that rotated around and hit Siberia. Um, there's not the Chukchi borderland that also fed into that area. You're looking skeptical. Well, I dredged rocks from the Chichi borderland, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes, uh, so, how long ago? I'll talk to you about that after. Yes, please do. I'll probably read your work. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah we know that there are young basins crisscrossing the, the Chichi borderland. That's the, that's, that's, that seems to, uh, the, the, to be the case. I think that it is Crocker land, and that yeah. it actually belonged to Korea and Southwest Svalbard. Yeah. And so it was not part of the this spirit of it at all. It was part of the origin. But it is, if, it, if it's Crocker land, then it, then it, it, it would be at least the provenance area. The, the not. provenance area, yeah, yes. Exactly. Okay, well, that's yes. what I meant. Yeah. I think we can agree on that one. Yeah. Okay. We got a question over here. Yeah. Have you mapped, given the map that you have, have you mapped the Paleo rivers <coughs> empty in the Arctic Ocean and where are the major sediment supplies? You know, we have, and, uh, and, and so we have done that piece of work. We did a, a part of this project, and you, you can tell that this was a very superficial skip over the surface, right? There's lots of stuff underneath this, and one of them is a source to sink piece of work where we actually looked at where the Paleo rivers were. That was done by one of my colleagues, so if you're gonna pin me down now and say specifically where were those rivers, then I think you've got me. But, uh, but we, we, we've done that work, yeah. Uh, for a whole series of paleogeographic time slices going through. Going once, going twice, going three times? Okay. We have, uh, we have a small gift from the Houston Geological Society, and it's not from the Triassic, and it's not from the uh, Arctic area, but it's a nice piece of beautiful petrified wood from the Miocene in East Texas. It's a dogwood. <laughs> 
Oh, so great. Thank I've you very one, much. I've got one of those in my garden. Thank you. All right. OK. <laughs> Okay, thank you all folks.